afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. Um, as you all know, we're storytellers and we're activists, we're researchers, we're folks who believe in the power of stories in creating change. So I thought it was only fitting today to tell you a few personal stories that have had a profound impact on me and some of the lessons we've been learning through our work at Just Vision. Now, meet my parents. My father is Palestinian. He's from the village of Tul Karim, which today is under Israeli military occupation. He and his family were expelled during the War of 1967. My mother is Korean, born and raised in the metropolis of Seoul in the aftermath of the Korean War. Now, how my parents met, that's a fascinating story that I'm gonna save for another day, but the bottom line is that they found their way to Southern California, where I was born and raised into a multi-ethnic, multi-faith, multi-racial family. And I remember very early on in my life grappling with deep questions of race and identity, of ethnicity, of the impact on war, of war on our family, on real people whose stories never made it into the headlines. Then 9-11 happened, and I remember what was very introspective questions quickly shifting to structural and external ones. I was in 11th grade that day, and I remember walking into my homeroom classroom. The television was out, and the screen was running, loops of the Twin Towers falling over and over and over again. I was shocked, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen, and a peer of mine, a young man, who had gone to school with me since kindergarten, and actually just lived up the street from where my family lived, screamed out from the back of the room, Sahad, your people did this. Now you might imagine how confused I was in that moment. Then in the coming weeks and months, my family members, my friends, and Muslim communities across the United States would be visited by the FBI. And I began to wonder how it was possible that people who had known me my entire life could have such twisted images about who I was and how our government could blame entire communities for a single act. Then I would see the United States go on to launch its war in Afghanistan and shortly thereafter, the war in Iraq. Now, that's when I began to learn about something that Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie calls the danger of a single story. And her words are so elegant that I'm gonna read this quote to you. Adichie explains that in order to create a single story, all you have to do is to show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over and over again. And that is what they become. She goes on to say that it is impossible to talk about the single story without talking about power. There's a word, an Igbo word, that I think about whenever I think about the power structures of the world, and it is called Nkali. It's a noun that loosely translates to be greater than another. Like our economic and political world, stories too are defined by the principle of Nkali how they are told, who tells them, when they're told, how many stories are told, are really dependent on power. Power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. Now, it's very similar, that idea that Adichie shares drives the belief at Just Vision that the media has a deep responsibility in telling a more holistic picture of the people and places and political contexts that it covers. Too often on the Israeli-Palestinian context, we see the mainstream media zoom in when there's escalations in violence, suicide bombings or military incursions or top-down political failures. But rarely do they seem to appear when communities across the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, and Israel are organizing peacefully, agitating for their rights and for dignity. This is a common scene right here in our own backyards in the United States. Like last year, from New York City to Ferguson to Baltimore, Local communities were organizing for weeks on end, demanding justice, and it seemed that the cameras showed up when that one store was set on fire. What that misses is not only the context 
of the communities and the political structures in place in these communities, but also it fails to capture the concerns and the demands of these communities who had been organizing in miraculous and extraordinary ways. Now, this is a very troubling trend in the mainstream media. But my team at Just Vision has seen how storytelling that disrupts these dominant narratives can also have profound impacts. I want to give you an example of one of those stories. A few years ago, my team began to document a series of civil resistance efforts that took place in the Palestinian village of, of, of Budrus. Budrus is in the West Bank, and from 2003 to 2004, they launched a series of in over 10 months of nonviolent demonstrations to stop the Israeli separation barrier from being built on their lands. It would have resulted in the confiscation of their agricultural lands and their livelihood, essentially the destruction of the community. Not only were they disciplined and sustained in that effort, they ended up, and I want to share a trailer of that. إنه الجدار حسب جميع الإعلان كان يكون إنه يفصل بين فلسطين وإسرائيل هون في بدروس إنه هاي اكتشفنا إنه جدار لا سلب الأراضي. Defense has in fact created a solution to terror. اليوم أنتم مدعوون لمسيرة سلمية. يتضامن معكم العشرات من إخواتكم الإسرائيليين. We saw the men trying to push the soldiers, but none of them could do that. But I think the girls could do it. لازم إذا بدك تنجح تقيم مخك التقليدي. يعني كنا في اتفاق كامل وكنا حابين إن هذا الجيش تتوزع على كل فلسطين. أي مفيد بيني أنا قدرنا نمشخين. أوز أكو شطري مجاب شتصبرون يسيون في فيزور أفغانات. وبرشوتهم كل هاي متصين لخاص. كم ست سلاك بلي؟ ست سلاك. أيتي بتوقف ش. كلنا نموت. وإنا إنا أناشين مسلمين. شافينو لهم تخففين. A non-violent protest is not going to stop the ultimate wave of defense. This is a peaceful march. There is no need to use violence. The story of Budrus is no exception. Communities across Palestine, across Israel, have been organizing from Nabi Saleh to Walajay to East Jerusalem in the neighborhoods like Sheikh Sharah, Abu Tor, across Israeli society in places like Haifa and the Nazareth and the Nakab or the Negev in the south. But when we came across the story in Budrus, we were stunned to see that the mainstream media hadn't covered it. And so that's what led us to document the story in this feature length film. And we released the film in 2009. All of a sudden, outlets like the LA Times, the New York Times, Dear Spiegel in Germany, the London Times, began to tell the story of Budrus. And in fact, 
um, Strategy One, which is a subsidiary of the public relations firm Edelman, came on board in late 2011 to conduct a media audit of all of the English language coverage of Boudreaux from the time that the protests began in 2003 through the le release of the film in 2009 and following the public engagement campaign that we ran in the US and in Israeli and Palestinian society for two years. They had two findings in that report that I wanted to share with you. The first was that from 2003 to 2009, 30% of media coverage around Boudreaux was generated in English language media. 70% of, of media coverage was actually generated after the film was released, which shows that by telling stories you can, that are moving, inspirational, and counter dominant narratives in our media, that there's actually interest there and space for these stories to be told. The second finding is even more staggering. Of the 30% of media coverage that was generated before the release of the film, the main messages in the vast majority of this media framed the events that took place in Boudreaux as riots and clashes and portrayed the activists and the residents involved as breaking the law and order, thereby justifying their arrests and the movement's repression. The 70% of coverage that came out after the film actually reflected what the movement looked like. There were women at the front lines. The movement was inclusive and pluralistic in nature, unifying across political parties like Hamas and Fatah, and also welcoming in internationals and Israeli solidarity activists. And importantly, that the movement was sustained, it was unarmed, and it won. 91% message penetration. Now, why does this data matter? As storytellers, we know that the world's individuals' perceptions of the world around them shape the way, not only how they see the wor worlds, but also about how they behave in the world and the decisions that they make. Just recently, two researchers, one at MIT and another, another at the University of Michigan, tag teamed Emile Bruneau and Muniba Salim to look at the extent to which Boudreaux, if at all, was able to shift American perceptions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Specifically, they were interested in understanding to what degree Boudreaux was able to reduce prejudice towards Palestinians and combat and challenge the dominant narrative that Palestinians are inherently violent, which is so often reiterated and reinforced through mainstream media images of suicide bombings and Molotov cocktails and burning tires. What they found was that indeed the film was able to reduce prejudice against Palestinians and debunk the notion that Palestinians are violent. And you can see that in the light green bar, which is the counter narrative or Boudreaux against the control and another film that served as the dominant narrative, reinforcing the dominant narrative. Importantly, they also found that the film didn't reduce um, empathy toward Israelis. And the reason that I underscore this is that so often when we're talking about areas of asymmetrical conflict, there's a deep concern that you're gonna have a pendulum swing. Um, that individuals, if they increase empathy for one population, must, must necessarily decrease empathy for another. But what we're seeing through this is that empathy is not a zero-sum game. Moreover, what they found in their results was that individuals who increased empathy for Palestinians also had a much higher likelihood of supporting behaviors that supported Palestinians pursuing rights and equality. And at the time of the study being conducted, what was in the news was Palestinians' application to the International Criminal Court, so that was what was used in the study. Um, the counter-narrative, or Boudreaux, is the furthest to the right of you. And there was a stark shift. Now, that to us was important because what that meant was that you can, on one hand, humanize populations and also understand that there are structural inequalities that have to be dealt with. Now, this to us have been, has been data that reaffirmed what we intuitively knew. Um, we have seen anecdotes of young Israelis who were planning on going off to serve in the military, who Boudreaux, 
would say to us, look, I can't serve in the military. They would become conscientious objectors, refusers, many of them going to jail to serve time for that act. Young Palestinians, like a young woman in Janine recently, who saw Boudrous and was so captivated by Iltazam Morar, the young 15-year-old woman that you saw leading the women's contingent in Boudrous, she stood up after the screening and said, I could be Iltazam too. Or communities like Walajay, which after seeing Boudrous community organizers shared with us that they had their most well-attended demonstration to date. So as storytellers, as activists in this room, I'm not here to share this data with you to reaffirm what we already intuitively know. Stories have immense power to inspire change and to galvanize action. Rather, I'm here so that this data can fuel you in the same way that it has fueled our work at Just Vision. We have enormous challenges ahead of us, from racial justice to LGBTQ rights, to the struggle for rights quality in Israel and Palestine. But what we know is that when courageous activists take on these challenging issues and storytellers have the foresight to broadcast their message to the world, people's minds do change, social norms do shift, and ultimately we will transform these issues. I'm looking forward to doing that work with you and I thank you so much for your time. <laughs>